let's get started. We won't uh, muck around too much. We got a lot to cover. Welcome to the uh, Outlook 2023. Inflation is the key. So uh, let's uh, let's go through a few things here. There's our presentation page. Thanks, Davina, for your help. Uh, before we start about 2023, let's kind of go through some numbers on 2022. It's interesting, we started the year by saying it would be a difficult one. Um, and here we, are, here we are, S and P 500, U.S. Uh, 500 largest companies minus 19.4. The Nasdaq market, which is tend to be technology focused, minus 33.1. Dow Jones with not as much technology exposure minus 8.8. Toronto Stock Exchange 8.8. Uh, IFA is uh, Europe, uh, Far East, and Africa minus 16.6. S&P 500 equal weight. So if you took the 500 companies, but you didn't put uh, the, you know, uh, seven, eight percent in Apple and you had one 500th in each one, you uh, did better than the S&P 500. So that kind of looks like what the average stock did last year. Um, I just put a couple of notables in here. ARK Innovation Fund, which got trounced last year, second year in a row, minus 67 these are companies without any profits. Um, you know, they're supposed to be the new innovators. TD US Blue Chip, the largest equity funded Toronto Dominion Bank with a name like TD US Blue Chip. How could you lose? Like with a name like Smuckers, it must be good jam. With a name like US uh, Blue Chip, minus 35%, uh, percent, um, tough year. Um, the story doesn't end at um, the stock market. Um, U.S. Treasury market just suffered its worst ever annual loss. A poor uh, picture of a poor uh, bond trader there. Good news is uh, we saw this coming and we, uh, we, um, we avoided that sector entirely. Um, so uh, last year... Um, the exchange traded fund, BMO Universal Bond, minus 14.6. TD Bond Fund, minus 14.4. RBC Bond, minus 15.2. RBC Balance Fund, which is 60% uh, equities and 40% bonds, minus 14%. Um, percent. So what was going on last year? Num number one is, the good news is we uh, did uh, way better than the indexes. And uh, that's good news. Um, a lot of it, we saw it coming. Now, I did say it would be a difficult year, but I thought we could get on the correct side of the zero line. We were on the, we were trending that way. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. We were trending that way, uh, but we didn't quite make it, but uh, not a disaster, especially uh, given our best year in my 37 years in 2021. Uh, we're starting in a very, very well in 2022, and uh, with any luck, all those losses of last year would be made up in short order. The exception is we had a few clients who we had some conversations with, and they said they would like to have an, a higher exposure to energy. Of course, we had some in all, all our clients. Um, they did very, very well and came well into positive territory. And it was a tougher year if you were the one, one of the few who said, I want no energy exposure. Well, it was a tough year because that was the best uh, sector in the market. Um, so we were trending very, very well. And uh, um, I was hoping to get on the correct side of the ledger um, for 2022. And this is what happened in December. Now, the US, has a Federal Reserve Board and they set interest rates. And, and this is December headline, Fed's Powell, Jerome Powell is the chairman of the US Federal Reserve Board, says inflation battle not won, more hikes coming. Well, the market was trending higher and just said, what? Um, inflation uh, is um, was, people were feeling it was coming down. And he says, no, no, we're going higher on interest rates. Now I can tell you, that this is going to be the key to 2023. And it's, it's very, very difficult to make money in a rising rate environment. Asset prices typically 
are, are valued based on interest rates, rising interest rates is a negative for asset classes. So let's talk about this for a second because, whoops, um, this is a headline from June of 2020. Fed not thinking about raising rates. In fact, the exact quote is, we're not even thinking about thinking about raising interest rates. Now that was June of 2020. Um, we, we talk about the instruments of monetary policy, which is money supply and interest rates. And if you can go back to your economics, there's two principles that guide the economic cycle. And one is the monetary policy. And if you remember your history books, Milton Friedman was the father of monetary policy and believed that when times are good, you raise rates and cool the economy. When times are bad, you lower rates and encourage people to borrow and spend. The Keynesians believe that um, it's the government's responsibility to spend in a recession and uh, contract spending in a, in a good time. Unfortunately, governments like to spend in a recession, they like to spend in good times. So let's talk about the track record of the Federal Reserve because in June of 2020, they also came out with what they call the dot plots. And the dot plots say, here's where we anticipate interest rates are going to go. So we're not even thinking about thinking about interest rates. They anticipated that by the end of 2023, rates would rise to three quarters of 1%. Boy, was that wrong. Now, one of the instruments of monetary policy is something called moral suasion. Now, maybe they knew that rates were going up, but we were still in June of 2020, we were still on COVID lockdowns. And so it was very important that, that mortgage rates, which are set by the bond market, rates started rising and they said, no, 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 don't rise. So they were trying to talk everyone into saying that, that, um, that interest rates would stay low for a, a very long period of time. The bond market's kind of like, I'm gonna show you something here. The bond market, um, Actually, if you had listened to the US Federal Reserve Board and bought, so there is a time from, from when, the, when the comment came out. So you had about one month where you listened to the Fed and you made money. But look at that, that's a chart of the exchange traded fund of, of long-term US treasuries, which, which reflect inflation and interest rate expectations for the long run. And if you had listened, you're down more than 30%. So it was maybe terrible advice, or maybe in, in the face of COVID, they really didn't want any part of the interest rates to go up long-term, short-term. So um, let's examine the US is today still worried about inflation and they do not want any part of interest rates going down. So they wanna keep interest rates up. So it's the opposite of where we were in 2020. So here is one of our clues. Now I said to you in 2021 that, that there was a problem and that inflation would go up materially. Now, why was I confident in saying that? This is a chart of US money supply. And we've, we, we, we've been through this before. I'd watch any of my other previous seminars. Um, rates were zero. And we said, that, that, listen, inflation is the key. The, the, there's an interesting thing that's happening though. And that is that line has stopped moving up parabolically. You could see the trend line here uh, 2013 to, to just COVID, that's a 6%. And, and I'll just give you the math. The productivity from computerization and technology means that if you can produce more goods with the same amount of labor and capital, then you can, you can create uh, wealth without creating inflation. 
So 6% became 2% product, uh, population growth, 2% productivity growth, and 2% inflation. So you, you grew the money supply at six, and then we grew it at 40, uh, which created the inflation. But look at the right-hand side. Look at 2022. You can see that line. There's a, there's a snapshot of the one-year money supply, which is now growing at zero, the trend uh, since March lower. So that's interesting. That suggests that inflation at some point is going to come down. Now, I say inflation is the key. If you could say, give me one single economic indicator. If, you, if I had just one to predict the markets, the one indicator would be, tell me what inflation is going to be. So 2021, we said uh, it's going to be a difficult year. And that's because inflation was going higher. And, and therefore, and the reason we're worried about inflation, inflation itself does not cause lower stock prices, but higher interest rates are is the kryptonite. The kryptonite to Superman, high interest rates is the kryptonite to the stock market. So let's talk about the four-year presidential cycle. Here's another reason I was negative on the markets last year. So the worst time to be in the stock market is the second year of a presidential term. First year's honeymoon phase, the second year. Now, why is it difficult? Because history says that the US Federal Reserve tends to raise rates in the second year of the, of the cycle. Now, the good news is the second year is behind us. We're entering the third year, which is the best year. Now, why is the third year the best year? Because the US Fed tends to stop raising rates. And again, it's not necessarily that rates need to come down, they need to stop going up. So where are we? Because the Fed just said, we're not done, we're raising rates. So um, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna come back to this in a minute and I'm gonna show you a slide, very interesting because we avoided bonds, but we also, an extremely low exposure to large cap technology. Um, if you can remember, I did a slide in September 2021, what would you do with 750 billion? Now, not all of you have 750 billion, so it's hypothetical, but it, it, in, if you did have 750 billion, you could have bought all of Tesla. That was in September of 2021. Or you could have bought with 750 billion, all of the 11 companies listed on the right-hand scale, I had to kind of fit in to make it equal. And with Tesla, you had no dividends and no earnings. And what with the other companies, you had 74 billion in earnings and 24 billion in dividends. Now it's very interesting in a very difficult year because you know why didn't we get more proactive? Well, so in this very very difficult stock env environment, uh, if you had bought. Tesla, you're now at 365 billion, you've lost 51% of your wealth. But if you bought those 11 companies in this very difficult stock environment, you're minus 2%. So just, um, we, we didn't really see the sky falling. We didn't see valuations of, of the stock market anywhere close to, to 2020. So um, we didn't see the need to get overly defensive um, and so let's go back to, again, the outlook. U.S. central bank hikes interest rates by the biggest amount. So this is halfway through. There's a headline, Jerome Powell looking concerned. He's raising interest rates at the fastest pace since 1994. Now, I can remember, I'm getting old because I can remember 1994 like it was yesterday, and some of the people on my team weren't even born yet. But uh 1994, I can remember uh, we owned a lot of bonds yielding, you know, seven, eight percent and rates were going up and the bonds were falling and clients were very concerned and a couple of transfer outs because their bonds were falling. I said, well, clients, you're getting eight percent, like just hang on to the bonds. Um, turned out to be a very great trade. But in 1994, um, stocks are down, bonds are down. And again, they were they were moving together. So. I've had experience with bonds don't always hedge stocks, and that was the case, and this is what I saw going forward. So 
And by the way, 1994, down on stocks, down on bonds, was the second year of a presidential term. <laughs> Here's the third year of that presidential term, plus 34. Interesting, I'm not predicting plus 34, but interesting similarities. Um, let's look, okay, so we said, if I could have one piece of data, give me what inflation's going to do, because the backdrop for, for rising inflation is difficult for stocks. It's salmon swimming upstream. When inflation is falling, that means you're, you're at the end of an interest rate hiking cycle. This is the Bank of Canada website. It's an excellent website. Not a lot of things the government do is excellent, but you can dive right into the inflation data on a monthly basis. And I want to point out, so these are what the, what the bank on the left-hand side the Bank of Canada, every 20 or 25 years, they readjust it, but they set a baseline. And the baseline is um, uh, in 2000 is 100. So what's the cost of living? And so every month they come up with, well, the cost of living by November of 2022 was 54% higher. Now, this was the largest increase. So we have that baseline number. And I want to point out on the left-hand column, November of 2021, you can see these numbers really, you're going from 144.2 uh, to 144.8, and then 145.3, and then my goodness, 146.8. And look at that March number up two points two points over 148, one month, you're up 1.4% on inflation, holy cow, in one month. So, so if we say, what's the inflation rate? The Bank of Canada and the US Fed seemed hell bent on reacting to the 12 month number. So the mechanics of the 12 month number is simply, you take off one at the bottom, and you add one at the top, okay? So let's look at the seven months of really rapidly rising. Those seven months were annualizing inflation of 10%, numbers not seen since 1981. Well, this is terrible news. That means inflation, ought, interest rates ought to be going to 11 mortgages at you know 14 like 1980s, this would be terrible news. No wonder the stock market was falling. Now we talked about this on one of the calls. Again, you can pull this up. Is this 1946 where there's supply chain problems or is this 1981? We said it looked a lot more like 1946 where the world war had ended and you got all kinds of supply chain inflation, I think hit 17 and then began to fall. So let's look at the last five months of this monthly data. We'll get the uh, December readings shortly. We got the December readings in the United States and they actually fell decimal one. So again, if we did this exercise in the US, it's even more good news. The five month number is slightly below 2% on an annualized basis. So the Fed seems to be waiting for a couple of things. They're waiting, number one, to see the 12 month number. And the reason they do this, they do not want inflation embedded into expectations where every time there's a new batch of inventory, you raise your price. And every time the nurses or the teachers or somebody goes on strike, they say, well, inflation is seven. We, we need a base of seven. Once you get that where everything's going up, it's really painful to stop it. So until that headline number comes down, but the headline number is going to come down because you're taking off that eventually, by the time we get the April number, which April in, you know, you will take off April of last year, you're taking off a 1.3 and you're adding a 0.2 or something, it's going to say, so the 12 month is 6.8. We're gonna have a number that's still in the sixes and then we're gonna start coming down. So that's 
we have this information. Again, the backdrop for stocks, year three of the presidential cycle, the backdrop for stocks is uh, extremely positive in history when inflation is going down. It's going down. So that's the good news. Um, you know, the last, the uh, I said they're waiting for two things. They're waiting for uh, in the headline to come down, which is going to happen in the next few months. They're also waiting, there's a shortage of labor. Now, wages are growing at 4.6% in the US. They probably wanna see that number. There's a down to three and a half. There's a labor uh, shortage, but you know, the, the last bit of data that rolls down is jobs. It, it's, you know, when, when you're into recovery, people go, oh, well, everyone, they're still, you know, very high unemployment and people, they miss it. If you wait for jobs, you've missed it. Goldman Sachs cutting 3,200 employees this week. This is from the first week of January. Amazon says CEO will ax 18,000 jobs. We're beginning to see, especially and ironically, technology has seemed to was immune. Um, let me just talk uh, for a second about, um, you know, again, this, the cycles. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, um, you know, we're into a scenario where there is very, very good value in pockets of the market. And um, uh, again, um, I'm going to talk about one of those um, prefer, preferred shares. This is my quote, caught up and in, in liquidate everything. So when the market's down again and people are despondent, they're selling their preferred shares. Um, but I say fundamentals are the best in 30 years. We, we haven't seen these kind of interest rates in a in a in a very very long time and and the you you could buy a fixed rate preferred and get more than six percent on a company like um, Empire Life you could buy more than six percent in George Weston food distribution company and and super and super stores and Loblaws um, not a not a high risk cyclical oh my goodness we're going into recession. Um, Fundamentals best in 30 years, we're getting over six. On the floaters, many of our preferreds, which reset, so they're called fixed floaters, um, they have reset or they're going to reset at yields north of 7%, some of them even eight. Um, you know, Bell Canada, we talk about those BCEBs. If you had a thousand shares, a year ago, your dividend was $630. Today, it's 1,620. Almost a two and a half fold increase. Um, um, I want to talk to you about second about what we do here. Let's just take a minute because uh, we talk about the bond market, and if you own the T, the you know the carnage really began as COVID began to end. So January of 2021, we we're still kind of lockdowns and rolling places, but beginning to see the end light of the tunnel. We we're getting vaccinated. Uh, the good news on the economy is terrible news for, for bonds. So if you bought the TD bond fund uh, two years ago, you're including dividends um, or interest, you're minus 17%. Same with the, it's the same return out of the ETF. If you bought the, the ETF, the BMO Bank of Montreal uh, preferred index, just the index, you own ever, everything. You're actually plus two. So prefers have been a fantastic, well, not fantastic. You're plus two, two years, not very good, but you're way better than bonds. I want to introduce you. I'm going to start doing this in, in the team because our experiences for clients is, you know, client outcomes. And part of client outcomes is are we adding any value? And um, I want to introduce you to Aaron Hoffman because. As I mentioned, in two years, the index has performed 2%. We're over 20 in two years. Now, one of our questions is we're down last year. Okay, we are down a smidge, including dividends, not just price, because the dividends have been so good. And again, last year was kind of a sell everything year. 
So uh, Aaron Hoffman comes in before the market opens. He's watching, he's got um, reams of notes and data and, um, and he's in there working very, very hard and we are moving $650 million and we're actively changing one preferred. You'll notice we don't just buy and hold like the indexes, but to add 20% of value uh, for our client outcomes is, you know, have we justified our fees? Um, yes, we have. So Aaron, if you could say a quick hello uh, to the group, I think you have to actually use your voice or else you won't, sh you won't show up. But just this is Aaron Hoffman. Thank Thanks. you for all your, your hard work. And uh, uh, Aaron, what, what do you what do you think about uh, Aaron? Aaron was a client of ours working at a credit union and he was really smart on fixed income and, and he pointed some of the opportunities out to us. So we hired him. So Aaron, how do you like preferreds uh, for 2023? Well, th thanks Dave. Thanks for the good words. Um, I think there's a lot of, a lot of room to run in preferreds. They've had a, a slight increase in the last week, but uh, I think there's definitely potential for a good year for preferreds, particularly rate reset. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Aaron, uh, for your hard work and thanks for those comments. And we're going to introduce some more uh, team members as we go forward. But uh, this was appropriate. Look, um, as Aaron says modestly, we've had a hell of a good start on our common stocks and our preferreds. Um, I, I'm not, you know, one of the questions is, you know, do we like bonds here? Look, bonds are going to be the key. And I'm not negative on bonds, but I'm a buyer. No, a 30-year Canada is 3.1% uh, in a in a in in look. Inflation is not going back to zero, and I'm not a buyer there. Now, do I think you're going to lose your shirt like you have for two consecutive years? Not yet, but my my long-term trend is we're into a very difficult bond environment. We're probably looking a little bit like the 70s, and in the absence of in the absence of a severe recession, which we don't see coming in the United States, um, in the absence of a severe recession, recession um, inflation may reaccelerate again um, after. But for now, we've got the backdrop, falling inflation, the US Fed, despite what they say, they're just trying to talk you into leaving rates higher for a little longer. But come uh, the second half of the year, inflation is going to be down. You don't have to cut rates for uh, stocks to perform because bond markets are still very unappealing. I don't have people saying, oh, you can get 3% for 10 years. Get me one of those. It's, it's still not appealing enough for us to sell our Manulife stock, which yields almost 6%. Um, uh, again, I think that the greatest risks to the global economy are in these um, uh, places like Canada, was reading a Sweden, same thing, New Zealand, Australia, a high concentration of floating rate mortgages. Um, rates have gone going up at the fastest pace. Um, and you know, even if rates stop going up, Houston, we have a problem. And that is that mortgages are are going up 60% for people that are renewing, and they were already tapped out. So again, I've got my list of uh, um, things to do. Um, one of the biggest, and we're seeing this like boom, boom, it's happening. Uh, uh, Romson limits, one of the biggest mortgage investment corps, uh, Romson limits redemptions from flagship real estate fund. This is, if you have a mortgage investment corp, get out. They're going to halt redemption. Now, Romson say, we made 7%, but you can't have your money. When the trouble hits, you can't have your money. There will be this massive write down on the net asset value. And my clients from the 90s will remember, many of them had this council real estate fund. They did the same thing, they closed it. It was closed for several years and it came back out at 50 cents on the dollar. And uh, I, I see the same potential risk. One other uh, quick note, be careful of, I hear a lot, oh, I, I'm, you know, I'm 30% alternative strategies. Look, alternative strategies is things like mortgage investment corps. You hear a lot of private lending. So look, 
the banks are the ones that lend money. These are outfits that lend money outside of the banking sector. There's no free ride there. They say, oh, well, they didn't lose last year. They haven't been marked down. So if we go, we're going to go into a slowdown. Again, people who, who think that the, oh, I, we're going into a slowdown, therefore sell stocks, really haven't studied stock market history. The stock market is a discounting mechanism. We were down the S&P 19% last year in anticipation of a slowdown. As rates stop going up, you will now see anticipation of a recovery. So the market's way ahead of that. Don't think, oh, I'm going to wait until we've gone through a slowdown and through recovery. That's the wrong way, uh, wrong way to think about it. Um, I'm doing pretty good on time. I'm going to answer one quick question. Headline, uh, Canaccord Management, uh, including some of our team members, uh, are buying the stock out. First of all, this is good news for investors. Um, you know, the two greatest places I've worked were um, Canaccord and my clients from the 90s will remember Richards and Greenshields, both both privately held companies. I, I think, you know, you the management loses focus when you're worried about quarter to quarter when you're private. Um, you, uh, you, you know, you focus in on the client outcomes and the client outcomes leads to uh, better outcomes for the firm. And uh, Richardson was a wonderful company and Canaccord is a great company. And I think it's gonna be a greater company, um, not publicly traded. So I think it's uh, positive. Um, I don't think there's really anything more than that. It doesn't, really, it doesn't really change anything. So that's all I'll say about that. Um, Mark, can you, um, can you go through a couple more um, questions? I think we had a couple. Okay. So we received a few questions, well, a lot of questions. And if we don't get to them, please do email me. We can we can talk about it or I can reply to an email. But um, a number of questions on currency. So Canadian, US dollar. We actually talked about US dollar last year and how strong it had been against you know, a basket of, of major currencies. So what about this year? Uh, Canadian dollar. In the short term, we're going to be guided a little bit by seasonality. We're sort of into a seasonally strong period for the Canadian dollar anyways. So our short term base case is you can see the Canadian dollar uh, moving up here, especially if we get a traditional third year of the presidential cycle in a stronger market. However, after that, but double underlined in red pen, we think things get much tougher for the Canadian dollar after that especially as some of the economic data weakens. Uh, Dave's laid out the case for Canada experiencing a, a harder landing. And uh, as we start to see some of that data roll in, we think it's tough slugging for the Canadian dollar. So to summarize, in the short term, we see the Canadian dollar moving up. Longer term, gets much tougher. Second question, uh, a few of them are relating not uh, verbatim, but similar around a potential uh, Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Uh, we addressed some of these war-related questions last year. Um, unfortunately, history has given us a lot of these examples, so we have a lot of data about how it impacts investment portfolios and things. Um, the short answer is we really try not to trade around these things. Obviously, we hope it doesn't come to that, but money has to go somewhere, and history has told us that conflicts like that um, uh, it doesn't pay to trade around them. So uh, we'll watch, we'll keep an eye on it. But uh, generally speaking, those aren't events we try and trade. Dave, brief enough? Or, yeah, it was good. <laughs> I, think we, I think we did pretty good. Um, if we didn't get to your question, uh, let us know. We will uh, send us an email. We're happy to uh, um, answer any specific questions about your portfolios. Uh, and we look forward to putting last year behind us. And um, I think with good luck, uh, we, we get into new uh, makeup last year's um, behind us and we get into uh, new highs. Uh, so that's our outlook. We will be very um, diligent though. It's not set in stone. We're gonna watch interest rates. We're gonna watch inflation and we will keep you updated and we will make any moves of course as we see fit. Thanks everyone.